The Earth's waterway has long been man's easiest and cheapest means of transportation, and he has made most rapid progress with access to large bodies of water. Of all the continents, North America has the greatest interior system of waterways. The most important of these is the Great Lakes, reaching over a thousand miles into the heart of the continent. All but one are on the boundary between the United States and Canada. Lake Superior is the largest and deepest, followed in size by Lakes Huron, Michigan, Erie, and Ontario. 17th century English colonists found the Appalachian Mountains a barrier to westward expansion, whereas the French, controlling the St. Lawrence River, had an easy water route to the interior and its valuable fur trade. France established Fort Detroit as a protection against hostile Indians and to block British entry to the upper lakes. Fort Niagara defended the lower lakes. It was opposite the Mohawk Valley through which the British might cross the mountains. The French and English struggle for control of the Midwest centered around such forts as these. At Niagara, the many types of buildings and guns represent construction by various occupying armies. As the fur trade moved westward, the Strait of Mackinac became critical. A fort was also built here on Mackinac Island. Ever since white men entered North America, the lakes have been of vital importance to the settlement and commerce of the Midwest. The flags of three nations have flown over most of the forts which once controlled lake traffic. In 1825, the densely populated East Coast was connected with the Great Lakes by the Erie Canal. The lakes then became even more important in the transportation of people and goods. In winter, the ice-bound lake shores block shipping. Now the lakes give no hint of the traffic they will carry in summer. In spring, streams feeding the northern lakes thaw and the ice flows loosen. By early summer, millions of people find recreation on miles of excellent bathing beaches. Yachting is another favorite sport. Excursion steamers carry vacation crowds. Mackinac Island is now a popular summer resort. Visitors may see the fur trading post built by John Jacob Astor many years ago. Mackinac is no longer a military outpost. The old fort is now an historical landmark. At Niagara Falls, below Lake Erie, millions of tourists have marveled at the 160-foot drop. Some of the falling water's power has been harnessed. Below the falls, on the Canadian side, is a large powerhouse. On the United States side, another, supplying electricity for home and industry in one of America's most densely populated areas. The Great Lakes region has vast natural resources. Dense forests were once extensive, but today only the northern portions are wooded. Wanton cutting and fire destroyed most of the timber. Broken pilings are all that remain of huge piers which loaded valuable timber over 50 years ago. Conservation laws now regulate cutting and provide for replanting. Today, bays of the northern lakes are filled with floating logs. Some will be used in houses or furniture, but the greatest cutting is pulpwood, used in making paper. Ships' decks are often piled so high that only the funnel can be seen. These ships are unloading at a paper mill. A device called an orange peel is specially designed for unloading logs. When the ship is almost empty, an operator in the cab above is guided by a deckhand who can see deeper into the hold. Such machines and conveyors make it possible for few men to do the work of many. In the paper mill, grinding machines reduce the logs to pulp. After being cleaned and mixed with small amounts of sulfite and other materials, the pulp is poured on a wide moving screen where it is dried and pressed to make rolls of paper. 
Most American newsprint comes from this area. Your newspaper may have had its beginning in a Great Lakes forest. Traffic on the lakes is heavy. Conventional ships carry the few package cargoes and special types have been designed for carrying liquids and petroleum products. But the greatest volume by far is carried in this peculiar type of vessel. At the extreme stern is the engine room and crew's quarters. At the bow is the pilot house. The space between lacks any cargo cranes and instead of only three or four hatches, it may have several dozen. Often over 600 feet long, such ships may carry 15,000 tons of cargo, far more than most ocean freighters. These ships are designed for handling bulk cargoes and are called bulk carriers. The earliest such cargo on the lakes was grain. Important grain fields of North America adjoin the western shores of the Great Lakes. From Canada, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and other north central states, trucks and trains carry grain to the lakes. The world's greatest grain loading ports are the Canadian cities of Port Arthur and Fort William. Mammoth storage elevators dwarf lake carriers beside them. Grain pours from the elevators through tubes, and as the ship fills, inspectors take samples to check quality. The heavily loaded carriers from Canada and Duluth meet an obstacle at Sault Ste. Marie. Here the waters of Lake Superior drop 22 feet in shallow rapids, which were an effective barrier to shipping until modern locks were built. A canal lock is an enclosure with watertight gates at each end. To lower a ship past the rapids, the lock chamber fills, the upper gates open, and the ship enters. An operator closes the gates behind the ship and opens valves which drain the water from the lock through underground passages. When the water level in the lock equals the lower lake, the lower gates open and the ship sails out. The heavy traffic at the Sioux requires five locks. Four are seen here on the American side of the rapids. The fifth is on the Canadian side. Two of the locks are so large that they easily accommodate two of the 600-foot carriers at a time. Grain ships sailing into Lake Huron are joined by others from Chicago and Milwaukee. Many lake ports receive grain, but most United States shipments go to Buffalo. Here, other elevators unload the carriers. A device called a leg extends from the elevator. Inside the leg is a continuous chain belt carrying hundreds of buckets. They scoop up the grain and carry it quickly to the top of the elevator for storage. In a few hours, the grain is so low in the hold that scoops must pull it to the leg from corners of the ship. Scoops are powered from the elevator, but are controlled by small hand ropes in the hold. The hold is cleaned carefully after each trip, for this ship's next cargo may not be grain. Behind the elevators are thousands of boxcars to carry grain farther on its journey. Again, conveyors and gravity carry the immense volume of cargo. Considerable grain travels from Buffalo by canal or rail to major East Coast cities. Canadian grain usually travels by ship through canals and locks around Niagara Falls and the St. Lawrence Rapids to eastern Canada or Europe. Coal is one of the most important raw materials of our civilization. North America's main coal producing areas border the Great Lakes. Trainloads of coal reach the lakes from mines to the east and south. The transfer from train to boat is accomplished by special machines. Loaded coal cars are lifted by a mechanical dumper. At the top, the car overturns filling the coal into a chute leading to a lake carrier. The 
The empty cars are lowered and roll away by gravity. Toledo, Ohio is the world's greatest coal shipping port. Yearly, millions of tons are transported from Toledo and other Lake Erie cities to give heat and energy to many parts of the nation. Limestone, another basic raw material, is found in the vicinity of the Great Lakes. The largest quarries are in northern Michigan. Limestone is used in making steel, cement, fertilizer, and also has many other important uses. Stone near the surface is loosened by blasting and scooped up by enormous power shovels. The loaded cars are tilted, spilling into crushers without stopping. Conveyors carry the stone to towers, where cleaning and screening make it ready for shipment. While a tug backs a carrier to the dock, the ship pumps out water ballast to lighten it for the heavy load to come. The crew hurries ashore with time for only a few hours recreation before the loaded ship leaves. Overhead, conveyor belts pour crushed limestone into the hold. The structure on the deck can discharge cargo. Such ships are called self-unloaders. This is iron ore, another vital resource of the Great Lakes region. America has some mines in the southern Appalachians. But the world's greatest and most accessible deposits occur in several ranges near Lake Superior. The Misabe Range is over a hundred miles long. There is some underground mining, but the greatest volume comes from open pits like this one in the Misabe Range. Ore is easily scooped up by power shovels. These mines have supplied over a billion tons of ore which is about half iron in content. After the ore is crushed and grated, special trains pull loaded ore cars to the lake, where long trestles lead to the tops of huge ore docks. The car bottoms open, and the ore falls through the space between the rails into cylindrical pockets below the rails, each holding four car loads. Now a lake carrier approaches. On the dock, an operator lowers a spout to the open hatch of the carrier. Another man opens the bottom of the pocket cylinder and four carloads of ore pour into the hold in just a few seconds. With the help of only a few men, these docks load 10,000 tons of ore in only three or four hours. The pockets are emptied one or two at a time to avoid straining the ship with sudden weight. Deeply loaded carriers move into Lake Superior's traffic lanes. To produce steel, man requires iron ore, coal, and limestone. All three are found around the lakes, so it is logical that steel mills should be built amidst these resources. Coal reaches the mills by rail and lake carrier. Limestone, and ore mainly by lake. At Sault Ste. Marie, ore, like coal and grain, must pass through the Sioux Canal. Grain and coal make up about a quarter of the tonnage, while ore shipments comprise about three quarters, seven eighths of the ore used in the United States. Over a hundred million tons of cargo pass through these locks in the eight ice-free months more than the Panama and Suez canals combined carry in an entire year. In the Strait of Mackinac, a carrier heavily loaded with coal passes an empty returning to Duluth for ore. The continuous stream of boats in the Detroit River connecting Lakes Huron and Erie makes this one of the world's busiest waterways. Loaded carriers enter the rivers and harbors of the steel producing cities. At a steel mill, a self-unloader has swung its conveyor boom overside. Its moving belt pours a stream of limestone ashore. Across the slip are ore carriers being emptied by a special unloader which moves on rails beside the dock. 
Its bucket drops into the hold of a ship at the end of a vertical arm and picks up 15 tons of ore. The whole machine moves back to dump the ore on the stockpile. Huge piles of coal must be changed into coke. Narrow furnaces are filled with coal and heated. The heat drives off the gas, impurities, and volatile materials from the coal. A ram, pushing through from the opposite side, forces the red-hot coke into a waiting rail car. In a quenching tower, a water spray quickly cools the red-hot coke and prevents it from burning itself out. From above the mill, we see the bins of reddish ore, gray limestone, and black coke. All three are carried by traveling buckets to the towering blast furnaces. These furnaces are loaded through the top by small skip cars with a mixture of the three ingredients. In the furnace, the coke is burned, melting the iron from the ore. Molten iron is drained from the bottom. The limestone has converted the dirt, impurities, and coke ash into slag, which is skimmed off the top of the stream of molten iron and flows into slag cars for discard. These special cars carry the molten iron to the open hearth furnaces. Here, more impurities are burned away and small quantities of other ingredients are added, such as scrap iron, manganese, silicon, nickel or other minerals. These additions give steel special characteristics, such as hardness or flexibility. These men are adding a little more limestone by hand to get the precise mixture required. This mixing and heating produces molten steel, which pours from the open hearth furnace into huge ladles. The bottom of the ladle is open to drain molten steel into ingot molds. Later, when the bottomless mold is removed, an ingot of steel remains, still glowing with heat. When cool, steel ingots look like this. They will be rolled, machined, or drawn into sheets, bars, or wire to be manufactured into the many machines that transport you or your needs, or into the countless things you use every day at your work or in your home. The steel for all these things was once iron ore and was probably carried across the Great Lakes by a ship, which was also made of Great Lake steel. As winter approaches, a change takes place on the lakes. Snowstorms blanket the area and rivers become choked with ice. Niagara Falls becomes partly frozen over and below the falls, ice clogs the rapids. By November, shipping must force its way through loose ice in the narrow connections between the lakes. The Strait of Mackinac often freezes solidly. What appears to be water around this ship actually is solid blue ice. The ship is frozen in, waiting for an icebreaker to clear a path. At Sault Ste. Marie, ice closes the entrance to the locks. The gates are frozen tight and the locks drained. But though the lakes will be ice-bound and quiet for about four months, many things still remind us of their importance to man. Timber growing around the shores will eventually supply lumber and paper. Elevators in ice-locked bays stored enough grain during the summer months to ship food to millions of people through the winter. The Detroit River now carries no shipping. But smoking chimneys tell that reserve coal supplies will last until spring. The ore docks are now frozen in, and 400 miles south, stockpiles of ore and limestone have a blanket of snow. Yet they contain enough materials to supply the blast furnaces all winter, furnishing steel in quantities unequaled anywhere in the world. Now at last, the busy lake carriers may rest. Frozen fast, their hulls are dented from pressing against piers and locks. Their fires are out, and their funnels capped for the first time in eight busy months. America has much for which to thank such ships. Coupled with marvelous locks, canals, and docks, 
They provide the world's most efficient and lowest cost transportation. Their loads of ore, coal, limestone, grain, timber, and package cargoes have helped make the Middle West an industrial area. These great cities and many others depend on Great Lakes transportation for their prosperity. Many of them even owe the lakes for their existence. Their agricultural and industrial products are used by the entire United States. They are shipped overseas to many foreign countries, and so the influence of the Great Lakes is felt throughout the civilized world. The Great Lakes have provided a highway over which man has explored and settled a large part of North America and have also provided efficient transportation for our important basic needs, food, heat, power, and steel. The Great Lakes are vital to the strength and prosperity of America and to the well-being of the American people.